This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform perfect for content creators, business owners, and sugar baby bloggers. That joke will make sense later. A little while ago, I came out with a video where I watched a few different Lifetime movies with the word mommy in the title. We covered Mommy's Little Boy, Mommy Would Never Hurt You, Remember Me, Mommy, Mommy's Deadly Con Artist, and Mommy's Little Star. It was pretty fun to see what types of mommy narratives the Lifetime Movie Network had managed to come up with, and especially how different a lot of them were. That video was really fun to make, and it actually did a lot better than I expected it to, so I thought the natural next step would be to make a little sequel in which we explore the world of Lifetime Daddy movies. Similarly to the Mommy video, my methodology here was to just watch the relevant titles that were available on the Lifetime Movie Club streaming service. So I might not be covering every single Lifetime Daddy movie here, but hey, that just means more sequel video potential, right? At the time I started planning this, the titles I found were Killing Daddy, Double Daddy, Revenge for Daddy, and last and possibly least, Her Deadly Sugar Daddy. I am not looking forward to how many times I'm gonna have to say the word daddy in this video. But you guys already know the drill, so without further ado, let's daddy it up. Let's go, daddy. Let's take a little trip to daddy town. There's no transition that will sound normal. Killing daddy. Killing Daddy tells the story of Cassie. So I'm editing this video, right? And I just realized that the whole review, I call this character Cassie. And um, her name is Callie. <laughs> so I don't know what happened there, sorry. Played by Liz Gillies, so that's fun. Cassie is a troubled young woman who left her childhood home a few years ago after a falling out with her father, or her daddy, if you will. But when said daddy has a stroke that leaves him bedridden and nonverbal, a destitute Cassie comes back home under the guise of caring for her father, but in reality she is planning to murder him as revenge for her mother's death. She's gonna be in the top two for sure. Oh. This movie involves mental illness, including suicide a little bit, just so you know. If you've watched my videos about Lifetime movies before, you won't be surprised to hear that this movie has some deep ideological flaws. The Lifetime Movie Network, in my experience, doesn't have a great track record when it comes to depicting really any serious issue, but particularly mental illness. Here's the thing. Many, many Lifetime movies revolve around some sort of unhinged antagonist. That is par for the course. There are several featured in this list of daddy movies alone. And I don't even really have a problem with this when they make it relatively ambiguous. If the antagonist is just generically crazy for no reason, I'm like, great, cool, got it. My issue is more with the movies that give an explicit, real-life diagnosis to an over-the-top, evil, crazy character like this. I think that's where it can start to veer off into alarming territory. For example, in this film, Cassie is our main character, but she is also unambiguously the villain. She does terrible things, including, you know, killing daddy. And at one point, they mention that she has a lithium prescription. Great. The lost little girl with the dead mommy and a lithium prescription. So I believe Cassie is meant to be bipolar. And um, we learn that Cassie's mother had the same thing and that she took her own life. And that's one of the reasons Cassie is the way that she is. And like, all of this is rather insensitive just because of the sensationalist way they're treating it. You know, lifetime and nuance usually don't belong in the same breath. But then at the end of the movie, there's this awful moment between Cassie and her dad's housekeeper, Emma, who was in a relationship with the dad and ends up facing off with Cassie in the climax. Emma says this. All those years in that institution, all those drugs, they didn't do anything for you. They just kept the beast inside you at bay. You were born crazy, Callista, just like your mother. She says, spending time in an institution and taking medication did nothing for you, Cassie, because you were just born evil and crazy, and so was your mother. Like, this is low even for you, Lifetime. You know there are real people in the world who are bipolar, right, Lifetime? 
Some of them probably even watch your stupid channel. And I don't know if they'd appreciate you implying that all of them are destined to become crazy murderers. Again, if they had just kept this more removed from reality, I don't think it would come off so badly. But the decision to bring in these real world elements end up creating this really troubling narrative. I'm not a fan. But on a lighter note, there is some funny stuff in this movie. One is that I kept almost envying this actor playing the dad because his character is immobile and can't talk. And I kept imagining how fun it would be to show up for like three days of shooting a Lifetime movie and for the most part, just lie in bed doing nothing. The other thing is that Emma, the housekeeper, has this singing competition show that she tunes into every week. And Lifetime has created a very funny rendering of a fake singing show. The set and whatnot are very obviously not what this type of show should look like, but also all of the singers kind of sound terrible. I couldn't see a fly. Then it hit me from behind. It had me blind the worst ever, it's just also not what should probably make it into the finished product of a movie. And finally, like several other Lifetime movies I've discussed on this channel before, this movie inexplicably credits the financial consultant before anyone else. Still not sure what's going on there. As Lifetime movies go, Killing Daddy has some decent production behind it. There's some effort put into the locations. It's clearly not just filmed at some guy's house in LA like a lot of Lifetime movies are. Liz Gillies is really good. She's just fun to watch in general. But ultimately, it's a pretty basic formulaic premise with some uncomfortable messaging about mental illness. So basically like most Lifetime movies. Let's move on to something more fun. Double Daddy. Double Daddy follows Connor, a teenage boy who cheats on his long-term girlfriend one night and finds himself in one hell of a sticky situation soon after when both girls get pregnant. You are such an internet slut. Double Daddy is a true Lifetime masterpiece. This film covers all of the bases of the classic Lifetime formula. Unhinged, jilted woman trying to take over the life of an innocent whittle boy who's never done anything wrong in his life. Good girl character who represents the only acceptable version of womanhood. Strong pro-life sentiments. And of course, absolutely hateful, fear-mongering depictions of poor people. Probably the first glaring problem with Double Daddy concerns the circumstances of Connor's tryst with the antagonist Heather. Mild content warning for dubious consent. Because the way that this encounter happens does not seem particularly consensual. Connor is extremely drunk and doesn't initiate any of it. He's just kind of confused and out of it the whole time, while Heather is really aggressively trying to make this happen. Later, he says multiple times that he barely remembers it. Well, you should have thought about that before you slept with me. Uh I barely even remember what happened. So here's what I think happened here. This movie wanted to have its cake and eat it too. They needed Connor to sleep with another girl while in a relationship, but they also wanted to absolve Connor of any real responsibility for this so that he can remain a sympathetic protagonist and perfect little boy. But they also don't want to acknowledge the fact that this may have been assault because, well, that would kind of be a totally different movie, right? We would have to deal with the serious consequences of that fact. Plus, much of Lifetime's content, including this movie, skews pretty heavily conservative, so I wouldn't be surprised if the writers of Double Daddy maybe didn't even really consider the implications of this scene. So, we're left with a very strange scenario, wherein it's pretty clear from the beginning that this wasn't necessarily Connor's fault at all, but no one in the movie has the guts to start that conversation, so it's just kind of this uncomfortable cloud hanging over the entire story. On top of that, as I've already said, there are some really conservative undertones to the rest of the movie. It's very pro-life. The main good girl's parents won't even let her bring up the idea of abortion, and when Connor's parents do, they're very clearly supposed to be the heartless, morally compromised characters. There is a way to handle this, right? 
I'm keeping the baby, if that's what you mean. It's just sad to watch because the parents keep worrying about these kids' futures and the girl keeps saying she's not sure she can do this. I don't think I can do this. <laughs> and it's like, there is another option that would be perfectly fine and normal to do, but no one even lets her consider it. I hope this doesn't sound bad, but frequently when I'm watching media about teen pregnancy, I'm just like yelling at the screen for them to get an abortion. Obviously, if a teen wants to have their baby, that's fine. But I feel like in movies and TV, it's often a scenario like this where the character has serious doubts and just wants to get on with their life and is understandably really afraid, but the narrative won't let them explore all of their options. That was my take on the Lifetime movie Pregnancy Pact too. Like, for the love of God, just get an abortion. Lifetime presents a movie. Anyway, Double Daddy doesn't even entertain the idea. No, no, wait a second. I did not mean to suggest that you shouldn't have this baby. There's also the treatment of poor people in the narrative. From literally the opening few shots, we can see that Heather, who's depicted as very low income and coming from a broken home, is actively planning to trap Connor by getting pregnant because she sees how rich he is and she wants in. <gasps> I have picked you a good daddy. This is one of those conservative scare tactics where they just like, make up an enemy to get mad at. This doesn't happen lifetime. It's probably happened in isolated incidents, but there isn't like an epidemic of poor women doing this. It's like the welfare queen thing. It's just a boogie woman that conservatives have invented to make you think that poor people don't deserve to live. It's really kind of alarming to see this type of ideology projected onto this child character. She's not even an adult. Watch out, rich mommies. The world is teeming with evil women trying to reap the rewards of having your son's baby. I see you, Lifetime. I see you every time you try to spew some bullshit like this. You probably think you can just put this stuff into all your movies and no one will care enough to notice. But I notice. I'm on to you. I can't really do anything about it, but I can publicly shame you. So. Shame. <laughs> but other than its deep ideological flaws, this movie is pretty funny. I mean, the premise is so absurd. Anytime anyone mentions that both girls are pregnant, you're just reminded of how goofy this all is. I'm pregnant too. <laughs> There's this element of the movie where once it's public knowledge that both girls are pregnant, the other kids at school start like picking sides like it's a game. And at first I kind of thought this was too ridiculous, but then I thought about it and honestly this probably is how people would react if this happened at a high school. Like I would be so entertained, you know, seeing interactions like this happen right in front of you in the hallway. The drama. <laughs> I would be obsessed. Because I'm pregnant too. Bet that wasn't part of your twisted plan, was it? Heather also has a bit of an implied social media addiction. She feels like she has to post everything, even really intimate details for the attention and validation. So she like posts a selfie with her positive pregnancy test. Imagine going to school with someone who is doing this. In the final scene, once she's gone to prison for murder, she steals the public defender's phone to post one last selfie. Amazing. That's right, this is a Lifetime movie, so they couldn't just have Heather be a non-deadly amount of unhinged. They also have her murder her controlling ex-boyfriend. She tries to murder Amanda, Connor's girlfriend, other pregnant girl, but after a brief struggle featuring this incredible shot of two pregnant women launching themselves off of a cliff, she goes into labor before she can kill Amanda. And Amanda just like delivers the baby. She's telling her when to push as if she knows when that would be. But it all worked out. Since Heather goes to jail, Connor's family gets custody of that baby. Then there's been this whole subplot of Amanda's older sister being unable to conceive with her husband. So at one point, Amanda is like, why don't you guys adopt my baby since I am not as capable of taking care of a baby? Which makes total sense. Seems like a good solution. But then once she has the baby in the hospital, she's understandably very emotional. And her sister is just like, this is clearly your baby. I couldn't possibly adopt this baby. She's yours, Amanda. <laughs> yours and Connor's. It wouldn't be right for us to take her from you. And I mean, 
I don't know. <laughs> For one thing, I think anyone would be really emotional and feel really attached to their baby right after having it. I feel like if the sister gave it a couple of weeks of the teenagers trying to raise two babies, they would quickly realize that they actually wouldn't mind letting the sister adopt. And also, throughout the film, it seems like the sister and her husband live with Amanda's family in their house. This might not be the case. They may have just not included any indication that they live anywhere else, but presumably she either lives there or is over there much of the time. So this seems like it would maybe be the best of both worlds. Amanda could be around this child constantly, essentially help raise it, but have the ultimate parental financial responsibility fall on her sister. Sounds pretty good to me. Am I being insensitive? I just feel like it was a pretty good message to show her giving the baby to her sister. I don't think they needed this thing at the end where the sister decides to make them keep it instead. If you're a Lifetime lover, ironic or unironic, this is probably a must watch for you. The host of terrible messages, the entertaining unhingedness of the villain, the never ending sight gag that is having two pregnant girls that hate each other on screen all the time. It's a classic, would highly recommend. Revenge for Daddy. Revenge for Daddy is about Lisa, a sports-loving woman who lost her father recently, who works at some sort of undefined company in some sort of undefined job, and is pressured by pretty much everyone in her life to start dating on dating apps. Well, you could start dating again. You know, Lisa, you should try uh, looking online for a guy. That's where I met Ray. Did you ever call that nice guy Jerry I met at the market? There are lots of nice guys online. I mean, how else am I going to find you a man? <laughs> That's seriously the only thing you care about. She meets a seemingly perfect guy, but shortly after, her co-worker is murdered. And Lisa is framed for the crime, so she needs to uncover who the murderer is. I have to give this movie a tiny bit of credit, because throughout the entire thing, the dating app guy seems to be the prime suspect, but the murder plot ultimately has nothing to do with him. He's a total red herring. You might be thinking, Jane, that sounds like a pretty standard trait for a murder mystery. And you don't understand. This is Lifetime. Lifetime doesn't do a lot of true mysteries. Typically in a Lifetime film, we know who the villain is for the entire time. Like in most Lifetime movies, we would see this guy start to behave strangely, and then he would just be the villain. It would be as straightforward as that. So I appreciated that this movie didn't do that. <laughs> Good job. You did the bare minimum. But ultimately, Revenge for Daddy frustrates me, mainly because it is barely daddy related at all. Revenge for Daddy has very little to do with daddy. The vast majority of this film is just this murder mystery, and then the murders turn out to be very tangentially related to the protagonist's dead father. Like, the daddy isn't even really in the movie. It turns out that one of Lisa's other co-workers, Bethany, is actually Lisa's half-sister. She's Lisa's dad's daughter from his first marriage. Bethany had a troubled childhood, got convicted for murder at 17. I guess you could say she was guilty at 17. But she's recently been released from prison, changed her name, and set out to get revenge on Lisa and her family for robbing her of the life she thinks she could have lived. Life isn't fair. And sometimes, the people you love die. So it turns out that Bethany is the one who murdered Lisa's father in the first place as part of her revenge plot. This movie is maybe the most forgettable on this list. It's very lifetime bland. If anything, most of the things in the movie that I found funny had very little to do with the story itself and more to do with external factors. For example, one of the actors, the actor playing Lisa's ex-boyfriend, is named Charlie Gorilla. So that got a big laugh out of me during the opening credits. Another thing is that this actor playing the dating app guy reminded me a little of Henry Cavill, but not normal Henry Cavill. Specifically, Henry Cavill in those scenes in the Justice League movie where they'd done reshoots, but Henry Cavill wasn't willing to shave his mustache that he'd grown for another role, so they CGI'd his mouth and it looked really weird. Yeah, this guy reminds me of CGI mouth Henry Cavill specifically. I guess one funny element of the movie itself is this fake dating app interface. 
I always really love it when a Lifetime movie is trying to recreate a real life app or website or TV show, kind of like the singing competition in Killing Daddy or the TikTok style app from Mommy's Little Star. I guess they're incapable of just hiring a good graphic designer, let alone an app designer or something, because it always looks like absolute shit. Tell me, ladies, would you agree to go on a date with Mr. Wonderful, this stock photo looking man that you found on the Faces and Friends website? Wants kids? Definitely. Drinks? Only white wine. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe this is a good movie. At least it's not like stigmatizing mental illness or telling me poor people don't deserve rights or trying to keep me from getting an abortion or anything. Yeah, this movie rocks, actually. Best Picture, Her Deadly Sugar Daddy. Her Deadly Sugar Daddy tells the story of Bridget, a blogger who moves to LA with her best friend Lindsay, but soon realizes that she needs to find a real job because it turns out moving to LA to become a blogger is not the most lucrative endeavor. So she ends up taking a mysterious job from Anthony Glons, who offers her an extremely overpaid position as an executive assistant. Pay us 10,000 a month. Yours? Yours. And you can imagine how it shakes out from there. He actually wants to use Bridget as a sort of eye candy tool to tempt his potential clients into working with him. Her Deadly Sugar Daddy is perhaps the most infuriating movie on this list for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, imagine my surprise when I turned this movie on and found that the supposed actual title is not Her Deadly Sugar Daddy, but Sugar Baby Murder? Come on. I'm sorry, but Her Deadly Sugar Daddy is a much better title. Sugar Baby Murder is too obscure, it doesn't roll off the tongue as well, and most importantly, it doesn't center the extremely sensational and eye-grabbing word that is daddy. I imagine it's that lifetime thing, again, of these movies being released under multiple titles. I guess it probably depends on the year and the region and whatever else. But that is far from the most annoying thing about this movie. Let me explain. Here's the big one. As I mentioned, our protagonist Bridget's whole thing is that she is a blogger. I keep using quotes because when the movie tells us she's a blogger, what they actually mean is that she wants to be a blogger. Bridget's backstory is that her father was a famous author, and she would also like to be a writer, but not of books, of blogs. He wrote books. I want a blog. Which is fine. I respect it. But the thing is, Bridget has not started blogging, nor does she seem able to start blogging, nor does she seem to even really enjoy the act of writing. And on top of that, she also balks at the idea of getting a day job, like she badly wants blogging to be her main source of income immediately, despite the fact that she refuses to start doing it. Throughout the first half of the film, Everybody she talks to tells her that the only way to start her blogging career is to start writing a blog, obviously. But she's always just like, no, I don't know how. What would I even write about? So what, I should just write a blog for me? Who would read that? Early in the film, while looking for jobs, she comes across this revered blogging website called Swerve. So she's like, great, I'll submit a writing sample, and then proceeds to do this. Turns out, truth so raw is not so easy to put into words. She does submit a sample in the end, but she herself says it wasn't very strong. And then later we learn that she just submitted her English thesis paper. So she didn't write anything new for it. I read your English thesis. Yes, all of it. Odd choice of a writing sample, but it was good. I can't help but ask, if you claim to want to be a blogger, but have no ideas for a blog, and don't seem to enjoy the process of brainstorming or writing a blog, and are seemingly completely unable to start writing a blog, then can you really say you want to be a blogger? But words, I can do any and all things with. You clearly can't, Bridget, since the mere act of starting to write your blog is insurmountable to you. I guess it got to me because it was hitting a little close to home, right? 
Like, if we're being honest, what am I if not technically a video blogger? And honestly, the only advice I've ever given anyone who's told me they want to do YouTube but don't know where to start is that the only way to start doing it is to start doing it. We can make all the excuses we want about not having good enough equipment or not having ideas. I did that for a long time before trying it. But at the end of the day, the only way to start making videos is to start making them. This is a hobby or a job or whatever that is entirely self-directed. It's up to you. And so watching this woman try to start a career in an industry that feels familiar to me by not taking any initiative or doing any creative work and instead just kind of waiting for something to fall into her lap was extremely grating to watch. Another maddening thing was, as I said before, she submits some writing to this blog website, Swerve, and after submitting her sample, which was her English thesis paper, she doesn't hear anything back, obviously, but she goes to the Swerve headquarters and, like, demands to meet with the CEO or editor-in-chief or whatever. She doesn't have an appointment, but don't worry, she's been obsessively emailing this woman for days, so she should know who she is. Miss Klein will know me. I've emailed her. They even have this secretary who we're clearly supposed to think is a huge bitch who's being rude and gatekeeping for no reason. But I was watching this completely on the side of the secretary. Will you call her, please? I came here all the way from Arizona. She's just doing her job. <laughs> if this is truly the most popular blog website or whatever, she probably gets like 50 of these people a day who try to get in without an appointment. Anyone who has ever done anything in real life can see that Bridget is acting completely naive and unprofessional. If you want a job here so bad and you know you submitted a bad writing sample, the answer is not to go pressure the boss, it's to go home and work on creating a better writing sample. Or God forbid your own blog that you can then use as proof of your supposed abilities. Who would read that? Am I crazy? Is it normal for me to be as mad about this as I am? So anyway, Bridget ends up taking this executive assistant job with this very trustworthy guy, Anthony Glons, just because she can't muster up the motivation to start writing her blog. By the way, this job pays $10,000 a month. Pays $10,000 a month. Yours? Yours. The movie only shows the job getting creepy once Bridget's already been working there for a while. So I have to say, if I were in this situation, I would just quit at this point because presumably I've already made like $30,000 from this deal. I'm out. No harm done. I should also say that the reason Bridget had to look for a day job in the first place, other than the fact that she hasn't even started trying to work on her not day job, is that she and her friend Lindsay moved to LA, like found a place in LA and signed a lease before Bridget had even started looking for a job there. Now I just need to figure out how I'll cover my half of the rent. How did she even get approved for this place? And while I'm at it, her friend Lindsay is clearly supposed to be the kind of ditzy one of the pair. She's boy crazy, values money a lot, etc. However, <laughs> Lindsay moved to LA because she's going to grad school for psychology. Well, I was all ready to wow everyone in my psych class day one. So when you're actually watching the movie, it's like, seriously? Bridget is supposed to be our down-to-earth protagonist? Not the girl who's getting her master's, but the one who moved to LA with no prospects, but might someday think about starting a blog. But once she realizes that the actual purpose of her new assistant job is to look hot and butter up Anthony's rich clients, somehow this is what finally inspires her to write her blog. Oh my God, this job, this game, this is my blog. She starts writing like a diary of a sugar baby kind of thing. The unbelievable real life lessons of a sugar daddy. It's terrible. It's like if Carrie Bradshaw was someone who talks about starting a blog all the time but never actually does it. This whole movie is a bit odd for Lifetime because to me, it really smells like the product of an overconfident screenwriter, probably fresh out of school, who thinks they're really smart. That is pure conjecture. I don't know who this person is, but <laughs> that was the vibe. 
At times, the overwritten brain deadness of it all was reminding me of that terrible Amazon movie, The Voyeurs. Like, it thinks it's this smart, sexy, erotic thriller, but it's really just more of the same lifetime drivel. Every situation you encounter, you find a rhythm, a nuance, a way in, and not only do you adapt, but you flourish. It's like watching music be composed. And, okay, the last infuriating thing about this movie is that it's not even really about a sugar daddy, or a sugar baby for that matter. Both titles of the movie say that it is, and the characters explicitly reference those things throughout, but like, this is not what a sugar daddy is, right? A sugar daddy keeps his baby comfortable and well looked after in exchange for certain services and unspoken agreements. Anthony Glons, <laughs> it really rolls off the tongue, is a businessman who hired a pretty young woman to genuinely do some assistant work for him, like manage his schedule, and also to accompany him to meetings with clients, to look hot and flirt with them, to help ensure that they'll work with Glons's company. And at one point, it goes far enough that she sleeps with a guy, and it becomes clear that from here on out, that's what Glons is expecting her to do with these guys. I don't think that's being a sugar daddy. Are you a sugar daddy? No. So am I a sugar baby? No. To my knowledge, a sugar daddy is just a rich guy who provides a young person with nice things and potentially straight up monetary gifts in exchange for romantic and or sexual favors. It's like an informal escort relationship. What Anthony's doing is more like pimping her out. He's a corporate pimp. I feel like if the sexual favors are not directed towards him, he's not a sugar daddy. Semantics, I know, but that's the whole premise of their movie. Her deadly sugar daddy? More like her deadly pimp employer. This movie was not very fun to watch, but if you enjoy yelling at your TV, I guess you'll love this one. He wrote books. I want to blog. But you know what else might have helped Bridget get started with her blog? Today's sponsor, Squarespace. I promise you, I wrote that entire rant about blogging before I knew I would be writing this ad read. Squarespace is a great tool for anyone looking to build their brand, start a business, or just share their passions with the world. No joke, I've actually been thinking about starting a website for a long time, somewhere I could host more serious written content and film reviews, but I've been putting it off because I don't have any experience in website design and I thought I would make it look worse than a lifetime movie facsimile of a popular website. But luckily, with Squarespace, it's extremely easy to make a great looking site. They have tons of customizable templates and layouts, so you can ensure your pages look professional and aesthetically pleasing, but also add as many of your own touches as you want. I have to say, I really enjoyed the website building process. It's like playing dress up with your little baby website. I ended up going for this ketchup and mustard kind of vibe. For any fellow content creators out there, there are lots of ways to host videos on Squarespace, whether you want to embed YouTube or Vimeo links or upload the videos directly to your site. And yes, Squarespace also makes blogging very easy, Bridget. You can add photos or videos as well as schedule posts for the future. Sugar babies rejoice! Like I said, I've been meaning to create a website to post things like reviews, articles, and essays, so I was really excited to create this blog page. It has an Almodovar reference and everything. This is my blog. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com and test things out with a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your website, you can go to squarespace.com slash Mulcahy for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's Mulcahy, M-U-L-C-A-H-Y. You'll get it eventually. Thanks, Squarespace, for sponsoring this extremely weird video concept. Well, another day, another daddy. This was an interesting one. I feel like the daddy movies so far are actually proving to be more offensive than the mommy movies. Maybe it's because they center the male daddy experience, so women are more likely to be vilified in these narratives. I think this is kind of a genius business model, though, because words like daddy and mommy are very eye-catching and very memeable. It seems like mother is becoming a very trendy word right now. Cue the Megan Trainer song. I'm just kidding. I don't hate you enough to do that. But maybe mother could be the next big lifetime buzzword. I've actually come up with a few titles, so if any lifetime producers are watching right now, take notes. 
Mother's Deadly Secrets. I am your mother. Mother of the bride, but like in a creepy way. A mother's undoing. A mother's worst nightmare. I should check if that one already exists. Mother's Little YouTuber. It's like Mommy's Little Star, but it skews a little older and, you know, sadder. You guys should subscribe, by the way.